Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. We uh, have this uh, waving at the beginning as we say hello to one another. Welcome to everyone who's joining me here. Thanks so much for coming. And welcome to everyone who's joining us online. Uh, tonight we continue on with our series called The Apostle Paul. It's all about Paul. Uh, we're on to lesson number five. And this lesson is called Saul in Damascus and Jerusalem. And this picture is a portrayal of Saul in the house of whom, everybody? Jude. Jude or Judas, as it's sometimes called in the Bible. And he has no sight in this picture. And he's being attended to by whom? By Ananias, that's right. And this is whom we're going to speak about tonight. So as we get underway, uh, I'm just uh, going to mention, of course, that we are doing this as a duopoly. So we're reading the scriptures from the Bible. We're in the book of Acts. And we're also reading from this book called Paul, uh, which I hold in my hand here. And it's a novel by Walter Wongren Jr., a great author who's written many, many novels about biblical people, including, of course, Jesus himself. And what he does is he has dived into the scriptures and he seeks to bring Paul and the times that Paul lives into life. And so he, uh, he's a great author. And we're going to be reading that in conjunction with the scripture at the same time to bring all of this to life. So in our previous lesson, we learnt about the zealous persecution of the early church by Paul and others like him until one day when he was on his way to Damascus, he'd left Jerusalem. He got his letters of persecution from the high priest in Jerusalem and he was off to persecute Christians. And so he went north he went through this place, do you remember what it was called on the way? Where all of the worship of the cave was there at the bottom of a particular mountain and there was all the temples to all the false idols there. Of course you all know it was at the base of Mount Hermon and the place is called Panea, right? And so this is a place where they worshipped Roman emperors, where they worshipped false gods, where they made sacrifices, but there was a river that came out of the bottom of this place, and so it was a great place for settlements, but uh, it was a place of dire worship for uh, ancient false gods and sacrifice and so forth. And so with time, a synagogue was built there, and so Paul, in his zealousness, went with his mates up to this place and went to go to the synagogue and of course he began, he began preaching against what he called the new Jews. So they were people who were recently converted and of course he's going up there because the new Jews converted again into followers of Jesus and so he wanted to shut this down and so he went there to do his bit. From there he headed north and he heads up towards Damascus and on the road to Damascus, he has an encounter with an extraordinarily bright light with a force that comes with it that knocks him and his, his fellow gentleman that's walking with him to the ground. And of course, we find in the scripture that he was blinded and he couldn't see at all. And of course, from there, after um, there was the encounter with Jesus, does anyone remember what Jesus said to him? Yeah, he said, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? So in other words, he's identifying all of his followers as, as himself. And of course, Saul is persecuting them. So Jesus declares who he is and Saul has this encounter. And of course, this supernatural occurrence happens and he's blinded. And of course, his mates pick him up and they continue on to Damascus, stumbling there. And they deposit him in the house of Jude, or depending on your biblical version, in the house of Judas. And so this is where we're going to pick up today. Now, when he gets to the house of, of Judas, we find that Ananias, as we said in the picture, he comes to speak to him and to teach him what has happened to him. And what does he do when he meets him? Does anyone know what happens there? No, we're all going to learn lots tonight. He receives thee. Holy Spirit and what else his sight is healed again and of course zealous Paul who's been chasing after his fellow former Jews and persecuting them on behalf of the his religion if you will or on the temple or the high priesthood the Sanhedrin 
he decides that he's going to use that same zealousness and of course he goes out and he starts to preach the message about Jesus and of course he has a first hand encounter and so he's able to basically said I've met the Messiah myself this is what happened to me I know whom he is and now he's a converted Jew into somebody who's now there serving our Lord Jesus so of course he sets out in Damascus which we'll read about tonight and of course he's so zealous everyone always loves him and so what does he have to do he has to flee to Jerusalem. Does anyone know how he escapes Damascus without reading anything? On a donkey. On a donkey. <laughs> no, he gets... So you've all read your scripture and you've all read your books, right? Sorry, I sent out the message late. <laughs> but uh, he escapes. He gets put into a basket and lowered down the wall of Damascus oh, to escape at night time. <clears throat> so he slinks away in the night. And it's not the first time or so it's not the last time he'll be doing that either. He slinks away very often throughout his journey. So let's um, dig into this character of Paul. So in this lesson from, from this book, we're going to be reading, just to mention again, this book is available online. You can get secondhand copies of it. Uh, it is also available as an ebook, and it's also available as an audio book. So the book again is called Paul. It's a novel by Walter Wongren Jr., it's been around for many, many years, and there's many versions of it, but it is easily uh, to obtainable. So in this lesson, we're going to read from pages 62 to 70, and pages 77 to 80 of the novel, and then we're going to be also reading from Acts in the Bible, from chapter 9, verses 10 to 31. So we're going to be stitching those together. So we're actually going to start off with the Bible tonight. So if you want to open your Bible or devices, and we're going to begin reading from Acts chapter 9, verse 10. So we finished on Acts chapter 9, verse 9 last week. And we're going to read through to verse 19 before we turn back to the novel, Paul, to read from pages 62 onwards. So let's, uh, so let's go to the scripture. So Acts chapter 9, verse 10. It'll be under a section in your Bible, uh, which is usually called Saul's Conversion. I'll just read the verse before it um, from the previous week. And it basically says, So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And that wasn't because he couldn't find his mouth. That's because he was rather shocked. He was uh, dealing with this whole situation that happened to him. So, uh, so verse 10, uh, we begin with, it reads, In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. So, of course, a disciple means a disciple of Jesus. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. Does anyone remember when we were reading the book in the previous lesson? It actually talks about how this was the long and straight street in Damascus. So now you know why. In the scriptures, it actually recounts that and says that he is on Straight Street. So go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus called Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him, to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. What does this tell us? The Lord chose him because he's this strong and zealous man and he caused much suffering to his his followers. And so he says, now he's going to go and do his work for me, but he's going to suffer in the process. And so that's made quite clear from the get-go. And it also tells you about his ministry because it says, He's going to carry his name before the Gentiles and their kings 
and before the people of Israel, which tells you that he's going to be moving around a lot, which we know he does. In verse 17 it reads, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptised and after taking some food he regained his strength. So take note here that baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit is always associated together and it's also a commandment of Jesus that you are to be baptised in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so the first thing that happens when he gives his life to Jesus to now serve the Lord is he is baptised. And so we see the same order uh, of things that happens as we continue to practise to this day. Now let's go to the, 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 the novel Saul and we're going to go now to page 62 and this it starts off the words you should find there it starts off in the atrium of my house does everyone got that yep that's good so it says in the atrium of my house i tend a tiny garden where a fountain trickles into a small shallow pool after supper and after i had shown the young lads to a room upstairs i led saul to my garden he sat down on the stone bench where hadesh and I would sit of an evening. So Hadesh is? His wife. His wife, thank you. He's, he, uh, big pardon. I knelt before him with clean towels. I began to wash him. He did not refuse me. There was no help for it, but that I must remove his tunic. I laid sponges of warm water upon his chest and felt with my hands how narrow his ribs were, how thin the man was. So once again, the author likes to describe Paul's anatomy and we're finding out now he's got a long thin neck with a huge oversized head he's got thin lips with a shrill voice he's got bowed legs and now we find out when his tunic's removed he's also looks like he's starving to death with his ribs sticking out so uh so what does this tell you about who the lord picks to represent him he's not looking for the well-fed well-dressed man at all is he so <laughs> So it says, and it says here, and his skin almost shined in the dark for paleness. So in other words, his skin was so white he was glowing in the dark. So I think I don't think there's much left to be said about the poor man. And then he says, Saul, Saul, I said. The man said nothing. He permitted me to lift his arms for the washing. His lips pursed as if thoughts were going unspoken through his mind. His sight was gone. What else was gone? Voice, words. Saul, can you hear me now? I dried his body with linen cloths and wrapped him in a robe. Then I straddled the bench beside him. Medicines, I whispered, for your poor head. <laughs> so the head comes back into it. We know that his head's always been uh, damaged. Uh, and in this case, does anyone remember how it was damaged in this particular instance? Sunburn. He got terrible sunburn. So he was bald. And so when we see these pictures that are being produced nowadays, they must read their scriptures because this man's got hair, but he's bald. Okay, so uh, so when he walked all the way to Damascus, he got his head horribly burnt. Okay, so the sunburnt blisters were torn and running. I cut away the loose skin. On the sores themselves, I poured a lotion of myrrh. His nostrils flared. Myrrh will keep the flesh from corruption, I murmured. Can you bow? Saul, can you bow your head a little? So no doubt the myrrh stung his scalp. He did. My heart gave a sweet start. He had heard me. I anointed his whole scalp with a mixture of olive oil, verdigris, and a powder of lead. So, he, he, so he's giving him lead poisoning uh, to go with his other ailments. The oil would keep my bandage from sticking to the wounds. So now I wound a long linen cloth round and round his great head, whispering... This is the turban you should have worn from Jerusalem, my friend. But when it came to comforting his eyes, I failed. Oil of aloe could not cool the flaming eyelids, nor could it soften the crust that knit them together. I feared I might tear the tender lids and make them bleed. 
Searching closely the ruin of his sight, I brought my face near his. I heard breathing at his nostrils, I felt his warm breath on my cheek. The touch of my fingertip made him flinch. Jude, my friend, I need you. But I could not help his eyes. I stood up, come, my son, I said. I blushed, I raised him gently to his feet. Hero Israel, I chanted softly as I led Saul to a pallet, his, wo- his weight borne in the crook of my arm. The Lord our God, the Lord one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. In the black hours of the morning, Saul's two companions came into my room and stood there waiting for me to wake. They carried an oil lamp. In the flickering light, I saw how grim and frowning they were. It seemed to me that they were carrying convictions like weapons. They no longer were afraid. The one named Mattathias said, Old man, we have something to say. I said, what is it? Remember what Mattathias said when they're on the way up after all this happened? What did he, what did he say? Do, do you remember? He said, let's pack our bags and go back to Jerusalem. Right? So he was going to walk away from this whole endeavour. I said, what is it? He stiffened his neck and announced, either we've seen the work of a demon or else we witnessed the punishment of heaven one way or the other. There's evil in this blindness. Padiah didn't wait for me to respond. Right away, he started making a speech and soon I recognised that it had been planned between them. Padiah said, in the book of Tobit, it is written that while he slept in the courtyard, some sparrow droppings fell into Tobit's eyes and blinded him. We understand that a demon or a fallen angel did that thing because no doctor could heal him. For ten year, for, sorry, for four years Tobit prayed, but no one at all could heal him until the angel Raphael came to help. It was Raphael who showed them that they should put the gall of a fish on Tobit's eyes. Don't you love people who want to play medicine with you? I, I got bored up on Fryer's Balsam and Cod Liver Oil. I'm just reading this going, oh my goodness. It's been going on for a long time. <laughs> that's how he was healed <laughs> he got healed that's amazing an angel healed him so we know that a demon had blinded him demons can blind a man and we know that from the bible people become blind from demons so these are jewish people and they're sort of following their traditions and understanding by what they're saying Matthias, his neck still stiff nearly shouted or oh, remember what the angel of the lord did to the wicked men of sodom he blinded them He blinded them to stop their sinning and to punish them, blindings and blindings, and all, and in the middle of the day, Saul is suddenly struck blind by no hand we could see. One way or the other, old man, this blindness is a curse and you should renounce him the same as we do. He will be no help to you. And then they left. So who are they talking about him renouncing? They're talking about renouncing Ananias because they're talking to Saul and saying that this man who represents whom? Jesus is going to do what? He's going to heal him but they're saying that he's been blinded by demons and so they should renounce this man before he does anything. I mean that they turned and went out of my room and out of my house and out of the city disappointed. So in other words Paul is now on his own. Chapter 12. The leaders of the synagogues in Damascus are good and faithful men, some of them my oldest friends. They danced when Hadesh and I were married. They invited us to the circumcisions of their sons. They wept when I laid Hadesh in her grave. We are all of the same mind. We love God, we love Torah, and we yearn to preserve these things for our children and our children's children. At noon, the leaders of the synagogue came to my house and knocked on the door. Jude, they said, is Saul the Pharisee here? Yes, I said, he is here. I stood in the doorway nodding, yes, yes, but I didn't move. That's what we have heard, they said. Zephaniah told us that he met the Pharisee when you came home last night. Zephaniah is a good man, I said, nodding. It was very late when we arrived, yet he cooked a supper for us. I still didn't move. I looked down at my feet. We have come to welcome your guest, they said, and to hear what he might have to say to us. I scratched my chin whiskers. You will be very impressed. I said, Saul is a righteous man, full of learning and strength and vigour, I said. When he walks, he makes me tired, ha ha. But when he talks, he makes me wise. Yes, the Lord has sent us a teacher. 
Yes, indeed. And so Saul is always described as this man who walks incredibly fast. Jude, they said, why don't you invite us in? Then we can see this good man for ourselves. Well, but I have some bad news, I said, now lifting my face and looking at them with a kind of pleading. While we were travelling yesterday, he fell down sick. Sick? Their expression showed a true sympathy. What is the matter? It's his eyes, I said. He is having trouble with his eyes. At that explains why Zephaniah thought he was acting strange last night. So you see that this is not a good time to visit. The leaders of the synagogues looked at one another and, by their looking alone, came to a decision. Jude, you are a kind and generous host, they said. Please greet Saul for us, and when he is ready, call us. We will wait upon your word. Such gratitude flooded my soul that I could hardly speak. It surprised me how moved I was. Oh, my friends, my dear old friends, I said, embracing them. Saul will be well, and when he is well, I promise you, he will do well too. So in other words, he's not speaking the truth. He's covering for him. I watched them go with gladness in my heart and with worry too. Only slightly had I changed the truth. <laughs> Only slightly had I changed the truth. Before the leaders of the synagogues, but it was necessary to change the truth a little. I was a man in ignorance. Also, I had great tenderness for Saul to protect him both his body and his reputation, until he was strong again. Yet how to make him strong again, I did not know. Ignorance made me helpless. Not once that day did he speak or eat or drink. I laid the food beside him, but he didn't touch it. I laid a cup of water against his lips and tipped it, but the water only dribbled down his chin. Saul didn't so much as wave the flies away from his eyes, they landed where moisture leaked through the crust. They ate and drank while Saul sat cross-legged on his pallet and rocked. All day long he rocked and sighed and groaned softly to himself. Only when I knelt beside him and began to chant the evening prayer did he cease groaning. It seemed he was listening. I took comfort in that. But neither of us slept that night. It was hard for me to sleep at any time. But when there is a guest in my house whose groans are so deep that there are no words for them... Sleep is impossible. Jude, I need you. Well, and that seemed impossible too. God gave me the guess, but God hadn't told me what to do for him. The next day was Shabbat. Shabbat, of course, is Sabbath, so it's what we would call our Saturday. I finished my usual preparations before going to the synagogue. I stepped into Saul's room to tell him that I would be gone for a while. Whether he could hear me or not, it seemed good to warn him that he would be alone, so he would be in the house alone. Saul, I said, after the readings, when the men are praying, I will offer up prayers for you. Then my guest, the man who seemed like my son, opened his mouth and astonished me. Still cross-legged on his pallet, Saul said, Jude, don't go. I cried, Saul, Saul, I shouted, you're talking. Are you hungry? Do you want something to drink? He raised his hand and I stopped. In spite of his words, the man stayed hidden behind his blindness. The raising of a hand then seemed to be to me a grave and weighty gesture and I held my peace. He said, stay in the house to answer your door. A man is coming to see me. Aha. Uh -huh. So suddenly he's sitting there quiet. He thinks he's probably sitting there in great remorse and doesn't know what to do. In fact, he's sitting there waiting for of course Ananias to come whom the Lord said he would send. And so this is what he wanted him for because with an out of court with a door, Saul wouldn't be able to open the door for him. So he wants him to remain to open the door. So it reads on, because his hand did not go down again, because it stayed up as if he were a priest concentrating on the act of blessing, I waited, I did not talk again. The day was different. Saul was different. If only because he had spoken, I felt different, and on account of. I finally had three good things to do. First, wait for a knock at the door. Second, answer the door. And third, usher a man into my house to see Saul. And all this caused a tingling in me as if my bones had been numb, and now the blood was rushing back and waking them. I tingled because how did he know a man was coming to see him? Saul must have had a vision behind his eyes. The hand of God had reached down. 
the hand of God was doing this thing. So suddenly we've gone from demons to this is now the hand of God. So I looked and found some wine and there was good wheat bread already baked. I could not cook a stew because it was Shabbat, but I could lay out food that took no preparation. Fresh olives and prunes and other dried fruits and some smoked fish. Very expensive and pistachio nuts. Things are still expensive back in the day. Tingling and panting and feeling such a warmth under my heart that when I heard three raps at the door, I dropped the dish that I was holding. I knelt down to pick up the pieces in my trembling hands. That's how foolish I was. Now, till I heard three more raps, did I remember that I'd left the man still standing outside. So I laid the shards back on the floor and walked through the little hallway to the street door and opened it, and then it took two or three looks to realise that I knew this man. I knew him very well. And he could not have chosen a worse time to come and visit me. Obviously, he doesn't think this is whom Saul's talking about. Ananias, I said, what are you doing here? Good Shabbat, friend, Anna and I said. There is a man from Tarsus staying with you. I've come to see that man. So what does this tell you about uh, Ananias at this point in time? What does that that mark? He said, I knew this man, but he wanted him to go away because he was waiting for some other presumed person to come and see Saul. He's a converted Jew. He's a converted Jew. But does people know this? No, it seems not, does it? Because he's entering the house and he doesn't realise that he is a Jew who's converted to the Lord Jesus. Mm. So so a Jew turns around and says, Tarsus, I said, there's no one here from Tarsus. And <laughs> Ananias, go away, I have other business, come back next week. So his little lie has now become a bigger lie because he said earlier he was protecting Saul, but now he's actually denying outright that he's even there. I started to close the door. This was an outrageous interruption. Jude, he said, Jude, have you noticed that I'm looking straight into your eyes? (laughs) There There is no fear in me, my old friend. There is only the Holy Spirit and a command from my Lord. It is true that the eyes of Ananias were bright and his brow was confident. His voice was very strong. But I was going to close the door anyway until he took my wrist and said, The man's name is Saul, a Pharisee sent from Jerusalem, where he caused much grief for those who follow the Lord Jesus. You have no choice, Jude. You must let me in. He knew the name of my guest. Everyone knew the name of my guest, but Ananias knew even the city where he was born. A coldness started to clutch my heart. This was Ananias here, the heartbreak of our synagogue. Because he believed the teaching of those renegade Jews and what if. So this now tells us he does know that he is a follower of Jesus. Mm. I stood still. It's probably more reason why he wants to shut the door in case somebody sees him letting him in. Mm -hmm. I stood still. I did not shut the door. I did not widen the door. I could not think or speak or do. And then there came behind me the voice of Saul himself, killing my morning's glad anticipations. He said, is your name Ananias? Ananias looked past me and said, yes. And are you Saul of Tarsus? And Saul said, Jude, this is the man. I turned. My little guest was feeling his way along the wall of the hallway approaching us. He said, this is the man, Jude. Let him in. I am very old. When I was young, I could control my emotions so well that no one had to suffer them except myself. When Hadesh wept, I did not weep. I comforted her. But now, in these latter days, my emotions control me. And they are terribly strong. It is embarrassing how loud a show they make in me. I am no longer my own man. So, we hear from that, what? Men are meant to control their emotions, right? right. He doesn't think he's his own man if he can't control his emotions. So, it was with a sob that I said to Saul... What is happening? What happened to you? Why is Ananias here? Saul kept feeling his way towards us. I did not move to help him. Instead, Ananias entered my house and passed me by and went to him and placed his hands on Saul's shoulders. Brother Saul, he said, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I started weeping. Sadness was like a storm in me. I couldn't contain it. 
out of my mouth came a childish noise. <laughs> he says, wah! <laughs> Yet I watched the two men touching each other and I saw the crust on Saul's eyes crumble and flutter down his white cheeks like fish scales and then he was blinking and then he was seeing. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you. What should I think of such words? What was happening among us? I myself, I never had the boldness to call him Brother Saul. Wah! My eyes, wide open, I watched Saul bow his head, shining, shining with a strange white fire. Ananias began to unwind the bandage I had given him. Ananias was saying, You, Saul, are a chosen instrument of the Lord's to carry his name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, and the Lord will show you how much you must suffer for the sake of his name. So this is obviously coming from the scripture. Sight and light and a giggling joy in Saul, and he was beaming on Ananias, and something good was gone from me. Wow! But perhaps I wasn't crying aloud anymore. Perhaps it was the sound of my soul and loneliness. The two men walked back into my house, Saul on his own feet, leading the way. They went into the atrium where my little fountain trickled into a shallow pool. I did not follow. I didn't move, still standing by the open door, but I heard water splashing. So what's going on there? And I heard the voice of Ananias say, I baptise you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that high voice of Saul hooting, Jesus Christ is my Lord. And then laughter. Saul made hee hee giggles, a silly sounding laughter. I stopped crying. I went out my door and closed it and walked to the synagogue. So he's finally gone to the synagogue. He doesn't know what else to do. The name of my wife is a beautiful name. In Hebrew, it means new like the new moon of a new month. So that's the name Hadesh that we're talking about. And so she was in all her ways and all her days, ever new to me and ever young, but never the newness that destroys the old. Hadesh was youth to me, don't you see? She kept my old self young. I had already entered the 45th year of my age when we married and she but 17. Oh my goodness. <laughs> There was in me no deserving of such a gift of God. And then exactly 21 days before the Feast of Tabernacles, she became sick. But this was the year we had planned to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the feast. It would have been her first pilgrimage to the Holy City. But she fell sick and she lay down on her pallet. And I nursed her. I did not cry. I comforted her. Uh, but my Hadesh could not keep food in her stomach and soon she loathed the taste of it. And if she drank anything at all, she threw it up with terrible convulsions. And then on the evening of the 18th day before the feast, she smiled at me. All her pain was gone. She smiled a pale smile, as thin and white as the crescent moon. And then she closed her eyes and released a long, long sigh. And then she died. It was the day of the Feast of Tabernacles that I and others met with the leaders of our synagogues and together wrote letters to the high priest in Jerusalem begging help because a different sort of newness had come to Damascus to kill us and the help they sent us was Saul, the Pharisee, a zealous man. So they're painting the picture for why Saul had come up there because they had written letters inviting him to come up to take control of these new Jews who were Jews who believed in Jesus was the Messiah. When I returned to my house after going to the synagogue that Shabbat, it was already the night. I had lingered there till the day itself was done. I saw lamplight in one window of my house. I entered and walked to the room of that window, which was the room I had given Saul. He was sit in it, sitting cross-legged on the pallet. I had also offered him in good faith. He could see me. He could see now. He raised his large head. <laughs> I just don't let up there. He's, he's always going to get called a large head. He raised his large head and watched me as I stepped into the room. We both cast monstrous shadows from the single flame. I said, the pallet on which you are sitting, it belongs to my wife. He fixed his eyes on me and said, Jude, there is only one thing you need to know. The Jesus, that Jesus of Nazareth, he who was crucified 18 months ago, he is alive. And so that 18 months ago gives you a time frame for when this occurred after Jesus went to the cross. I bent down and began to stuff his possessions into his leather bag. I said, <laughs> good, good isn't it? For my wife's sake, I need this room and this pallet back again. Please be sure you leave nothing of yours in my house. 
when you go. So he's getting his marching orders. Jude, he said, It was Jesus himself who met me on the road. God raised him from the dead. That makes all the difference. I said, Go, Saul, go. He rose to his feet. Now he was the one looking down on me because I continued to squat. He said, Jude of Damascus, you have been like a father to me. This is a moment at which I am the most proud and for which I give thanks to God. I did not cry. I did not wince. I controlled my emotions. I stood up and faced him. My eyes to his eyes, I handed him his bag and said, go. And so he sees this as a good quality, unfortunately. Okay, so we're going to flip back to the scriptures now. And we're going to go back to Acts chapter 9. And we're going to pick up on verse 20. If you have a title in your Bible, this will be titled something along the line of Saul in Damascus and Jerusalem. And so we see what Saul gets up to now after he has been healed and after he has been baptized and received the Holy Spirit. Didn't go for a holiday in between. He decided that he'd just jump right into it, right? Mm. So it reads from verse 20 again, Saul, sorry, a part of 19 first, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Again, up to verse 20 now. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, that would have gone down really well because he's obviously in Jewish synagogues. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. Notice the words that are used there. By proving that Jesus is the Christ, which tells you what? At first they resisted him. If he proved it to him, to them, then they must have become converts. And so he's in amongst his own people, he's outside of Jerusalem, but he's converting Jews, what they call new Jews, at the end of the day. Verse 23, after many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. You, you can just imagine they're there going, yay, he's here, he's going to persecute all of these new Jews, these Christians, and suddenly he's one of them and he's preaching for them. And so he would have been welcomed everywhere and then very quickly they would have realised, oh my goodness, what's going on? And so mm. here he is. Uh, it reads on, But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him. Uh -huh. Surprise, surprise. Uh -huh. <laughs> not believing that he was really he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When, he, when the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. And so the Grecian Jews again are whom? Anyone remember? Hellenistic Jews. The, sorry? The Hellenistic Jews. The Hellenistic Jews. So here's a map again. So the Hebraic Jews were remaining in the Holy Land. The Hebraic Jews came from this region over here and across here. So they moved out into what they call the Diaspora after Jesus was killed. Remember, the Romans came in and they wiped out the Jewish people and they all went running for cover. So, of course, here's Tarsus, uh, which is part of Cilicia, uh, which is the region where Tarsus is in. And you may notice all of these names here, obviously, from the Bible, the books of the Bible. You know, Philippi, Thessalonica, Ephesus, Colossae, Corinth, all Greek uh, nations that are over here. So basically all the Jews that come from this region would come down to Jerusalem for what reason? Go to the temple. To go to the temple and, and Passover. And Passover. So the, book, the Bible just told us that all these events happened with 
Ananias and Jude. And he said there that it was the Feast of Tabernacles and he was going to go down there. But he didn't with his wife. But now, these years later, it's the same time of year again. They go down there for the feast, but also many of the Grecian Jews would come to Jerusalem to this fellow. Do you remember his name? It begins with G. He ran a school, an eminent school for Jewish people. His name was Gamaliel. And so they would come there in order to be taught by Gamaliel. And then they would head back off again. And they understand that this is how Paul, or Saul, uh, originally came to Jerusalem because he came to study under Gamaliel and that's how he happened to be there when he was part of the crew in the Sanhedrin who also persecuted and had Stephen stoned to death. So the Grecian Jews are in this region and the people who are Hebraic Jews don't accept the Grecian Jews and from what I can understand the reason is because some of the ways of Gentiles had crept into the Grecian Jews and you might remember in history during the time of the Maccabees a lot of the Jews uh, tried to reverse their Jewishness to live in the Greek society and so they had sort of crossed the line between a couple of them. One of the things they did was the Greeks liked to do what when they did their sport? They liked to get all of their gear off and so the Hebraic Jews at the time they were trying to restretch their foreskin so that the Greeks didn't think that they were Jews. So quite extraordinary stuff right? So um, if they're going to that length though it shows you that they don't care about their circumcision and what it means in terms of their covenant with God. And so this is the reality. Okay. So it says here, when the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So Caesarea, it's not a very detailed map, but Caesarea is up near Haifa today. So it's about here. And they up in the northern uh, part of Jerusalem, sorry, uh, Israel. And they went there, and then it says that he went up to Tarsus. So... If he went to this coastal place called Caesarea, this is where Herod had his palace called the Coral Palace. And they also had a, uh, a large society there. They had a hyperdome there where the chariots used to race around. It's where they used to kill a lot of the people. All those things you see in modern day movies. And so he would have jumped on a boat and gone back to Tarsus. He wouldn't have gone by land. And so this uh, helps us to understand that, that pathway. Then verse 31, it says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. So when Paul goes, peace comes back. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. And so we're talking about the peace returned to the church, not to the Jewish people. Okay? So at this point in time, we see... That Paul has come and he has gone again and things settle down again. So just returning now to the book, we're going to go to page um, 77 and read a couple of pages here, which speaks into this time where he goes to Jerusalem. And of course he leaves Damascus. So it reads, page 77. I possess one particular memory of Saul. The, the, cap, the, the, the chapter is titled James. So this is talking about James again, the half-brother of Jesus speaking. I possess one particular memory of Saul so pure, so luminous that it is, as it were, a pearl within me. According to the admonitions of our Lord, I carry nearly nothing in my worldly scrip, yet that pearl is there, that pearl remains. And in spite of all that has gone between, the memory ennobles our common past. It occurs at our second encounter three years after I had watched the young man, the Pharisee, defend Torah before Stephen three years after he had departed Jerusalem. So again, this is giving us some scale of time. Saul is reclining on a rude cushion in Simon Peter's house. Of course, this is the disciple. His left elbow planted on the table, his jaw in the palm of that hand, his head in a maiden's tilt. The fingers of his left hand are slender and very long. They cradle his face from cheek to temple. The tip of the little one caught in the corner of his eye. Saul is gazing at me. Simon's table is shaped like a horseshoe. Simon himself, as a host for the two of us, reclines at the central section. Saul and I occupy the extremities opposite one another. Neither of us has spoken since we exchanged greetings at my entering in. 
Even as I was following Simon into the dining room, Saul rose and spoke. He said, James. And then he said with explicit care, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, James. I replied, I'm afraid there's something of a bumpkin muttering peace in return. Obviously he doesn't like him. He grinned in wordless delight, then sank down again, and so did I. And Simon has not yet ceased his chatter, but saw his head in a light inquiring tilt, gazes at me in silence. This is our first actual meeting. He seems by the look of him to know something about me. I, for my part, have heard of his conversion. Believers in Jerusalem are highly doubtful of the truth of it, but this is precisely what Simon Peter is protesting before me with boisterous joy. It's true, James, it's all true. He saw the Lord. The Lord cut him down like a broom tree, then built him like planks of a good wood into a whole new temple. Simon's joy overwhelms all, and I believe him. I look at Saul and I see truly a servant of Christ and a brother to me. Oh, how I wish I could say some perfect thing to welcome him into our company. The man loves Torah as much as I do. So this tells you that they understood that they weren't casting out the old. Right? They didn't remember what Jesus said. They would all know this. He said he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. Right? And the prophecies pointed to him. And so they're not there to abolish the law. They still embrace it. <coughs> Uh, and with his eyes alone, he is awaiting my word, my word clearly, and I am moved, for this is his personal choice. Not even Simon recognises the supplication and the tilt of the good man's head. Saul is, by this reverent expectant silence, honouring me. Ah, what a grace, what a memory. And to round the moment into a pearl of radiant light, the Holy Spirit grants me now in this very hour the formal appropriate word. It is Simon's Peter wife who interrupts his talk. She enters the dining room carrying a flagon of wine and a single cup. She places these on the table in front of her husband, then turns and leaves. Why do you think there'd be a flagon and a single cup? Because they share the cup. They're going to share the cup. So let's read on and see what that means. So it says, I open my mouth and then before I know the word I speak it. And finally to you I say, Simon says, what, what, what did you say? But Saul lifts his head and folds his hands, preparing to hear more. Curiously, it is his very preparing that floods me with the rest of my welcome. Saul, I say, tasting the pleasure of my own participation in this sacred exchange. This we know, we have known, and this we have spoken so often in the last four years that the language has become fixed. We've said it ever the same until now. Now we must unfix the ending and change it, Saul, for you. We say, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 believers at one time. Then he appeared to James. To me, we mean, I say softly, then to all the apostles. So there's an order of what the scriptures tells us. I pause. Simon Peter is quiet, aware. So is Saul. Water is rising in his eyes. He neither blinks nor wipes them. Softly with ceremony I say, then to all the apostles, that what the ending was, but now the ending must say, and finally Christ appeared on the road to Damascus also to Saul. So in other words, they're acknowledging there's now a new addition to what's mm. been taught before about Jesus. Also to you, welcome Saul of Tarsus. Again, Simon's wife is in the room, this time with a loaf of flat bread, on a round clay dish. Anyone got any hints of what's going to happen? We've had the flag and the wine with one cup, and now we've got a loaf of bread. Right. They're going to take communion. And these two are elements, there's the word, of my blessed memory. Simon Peter is praying, his great arms swept wide open. Saul, in an unpretty voice, is singing Amen, and over and over again, Amen, Hallelujah. Simon is holding the bread in two hands, saying, This is what Jesus did among us before he died. He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to each of us, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Simon is tearing pieces from the loaf, giving them to Saul on his right, his wife before him, and then to me on his left. 
Simon is pouring wine into the cup, saying, And after we had eaten supper, Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave the cup to us all, and we drank, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And Simon Peter is drinking, and his wife is drinking, and he hands the cup to Saul, who is drinking, but then Saul is rising up and walking from his table to mine, and now Saul is kneeling down beside me and handing me the cup, and I am drinking. I am drinking slowly and tastingly and deeply. I don't think that's the idea, is it? And as I lower the cup from my lips, Saul is whispering, but I am at least, sorry, I am the least, James, and in me it can be nothing but grace because I persecuted the people of God. Mm. How true. And that is the close and the purity of my pearl. In spite of all that happened between Saul and me in the decades following that perfect moment, I have preserved this pearl as a sacred thing, my private consolation. Simon Peter says, Maranatha tha. I say, Amen. Saul takes the cup from my hand and says, Amen. And so on that note, we're going to come to a close. And so we see here the journey of Saul has taken him all the way up to Damascus with a view of persecution. He encountered Christ, he lost his sight, and then he was healed at the hands of Ananias and baptised by the hands of Ananias. And of course he gave his life to the Lord, received the Holy Spirit, and then went straight into action, talking to the Jews in the synagogues. And of course it says that people were listening to him because he was proving to him, proving to them that the Lord Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah. Of course he had to leave because people got upset, so he jumped in a basket, they loaded him down a wall. At night he went down to Jerusalem, and of course then at Jerusalem he found and engaged with first the disciples of Jesus, who then engaged him with the apostles of Jesus. And of course where this goes from here is the dialogue and the, the, uh, the engagement of the story with Peter. Why? Because they start to probably haggle a bit about what does it look like going forwards. I'm Jewish, I observe the laws, but now that I'm a follower of Jesus, do I have to still follow those laws anymore? Mm. Are they relevant? Can we eat something? Are you going to sit at the table of Gentiles if you're going to preach the word to Gentiles? You know, Jewish law forbids you to sit at a table with a Gentile. And so the, the next uh, lesson, we're going to go into having a look at that, the interactions, what happens with Saul and Peter. And of course, Peter heads across to Jaffa and he goes to raise Tabitha from the dead. And of course, he has a vision on top of the roof of the house. And when he's there, he goes up to Caesarea where Saul had left earlier. And there's a centurion there, which makes sense because it's a Roman uh, city. And he goes there and he shares with him. He baptizes him. And so we see this situation happen where suddenly Peter is confronted with the notion that he's actually going to be ministering to Gentiles. And in the history going forwards, they kind of separate the disciples they tend to stick with the Jewish people and Paul leaves and he goes abroad and he focuses on the Gentiles and so you can see God's hand in this because there's two tasks at hand at the same time because the church no longer recognizes the difference between a Jew and a follower of Jesus and so the disciples are split about their tasks and of course there's a purpose that's in there and of course what does Paul, Paul do or Saul now we're calling Paul he goes out and he makes disciples who travel with him, who continue on the Lord's work. And hence, the birth of the church as we do it today continues on.